Hello again, you're watching news today. Now, the Parliamentary Select Committee on Roads and Transport says the Ghana Highway Authority should have submitted to Parliament first being charged on a new ferry to Senchi and Akrade. The committee made the remark after touring the ferry sites on Monday. The ferries are now conveying passengers and goods across the water lake after the closure of the Adomi Bridge on March 10 for a 24-month-long reconstruction work. In fact, ever since we started the whole program, my problem has been uh, Ghana Highway Authority not sensitizing the people before they implemented these charges. That is uh, my first worry, and uh, I think it will appear in our reports and we know what to do. Actually, the first, as we see now, uh, I, I think they are too high. It's too high. We once, one interview the driver and he was mentioning these bigger trucks I think they can pay around 10 cities to about 15 cities which I think may be reasonable but looking at the 4x4s and the space wagons and others in fact paying 10 cities for uh, what is the saloon car then 4x4 paying 12 cities they are on the higher side so what we intend doing is we sit down with the ministry those involved and see how best we can adjust these figures and even in the morning the man who is leading the group to less they are reviewing the whole system so I think by now we, we involve ourselves in the charging of the face so that peace will prevail both with the drivers and the passengers we would all see the effects of a bad policy because immediately we went there we wouldn't know what this active book looks like on a normal day. But when we went to the ground, sure there were no cars there. So it shows the negative effect of a bad policy. And then the non-consultation of even the Ministry of Transport, which we're supposed to advise on a fair like transport fair. So I strongly believe that they need to come back and go to the table and take a decision. Um, concerning the illegality, that will mean that they need to come quickly to Parliament through the Ministry of Finance. And then that has to be laid for 21 days before um, they can proceed to charge. But looking at the fares itself, you come to realize that they are very expensive because you cannot jump from one city to ten city. That's a thousand percent jump. And that is just not proper. And I feel that that is why there's a huge backlash. It has also reduced the economic activities around the area. And I think a lot of people are suffering. I strongly believe that since we are not putting these ferries there for ferry sake or just ferry people, but as a makeshift arrangement to replace a bridge, it would be a good idea for government to cost how much it will run the ferries and then incorporate the costs of running these ferries for the next two years into the cost of the project because this is supposed to be a mitigation issue. It is not supposed to be uh, a permanent feature over this uh, lake. And I strongly believe government should listen to the advice. I spoke earlier with the director of bridges at the Ghana Highway Authority, Usu Setra Enchi, about the concerns raised. Take a listen. What's your reaction to uh, the observation of the committee that indeed the, the first you're charging are the ferries uh, unapproved? Uh, yes, I would, that, that is true. We, we need parliamentary approval. We haven't gotten that yet. But um, we needed to run the ferries so we quickly did some calculations and came out with the price. And that's what we need to run the ferries now. We'll be going to parliament for approval. But why would you want to do that in the first place? We are under pressure to open the ferries. You know, the Adami Bridge has been built for real estate for the past years. And the ferries were not ready then, so we couldn't start operations. And the ferries were only ready the week before we started. We needed to then know how much we needed uh, to start. We know the ferry should be running on, on fuel and a few other things. After the time we are doing this, we weren't actually sure of how much more we consume. So having received a, in, a, a, a specific, a, what do you call it, special data on the ferry, we know actually how much we consume. That's why we couldn't submit this thing to Parliament for approval. You, you had a long time to decide that you wanted to rehabilitate or repair the Adomi Bridge. You didn't consider approaching parliament or you didn't know that you had to approach parliament that is true we didn't have 
the full complement of the physical sustaining from the fair in terms of the fuel consumption. We didn't really know, so we needed to get something down to enable us to do some calculations and get how much fuel will, will, will be charged. Because the basic thing we needed to do the fair run will be the fuel and then the services that we have to be doing regularly, the very servicing and the these are the major cost components of, 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 of the calculation. Apart from the fact that we also sought some advice, not only advice, we sought some uh, to look at it. We visited a data uh, company that also runs ferries mm. and looked at how they go about their charge. The basically that's what we did in New York Cafe. At the bridge, we have been to have been done over two years ago. Right. Right. The contract has been awarded to the contractor. The contractor has moved to site. We haven't seen the contractor at the site. And that was running to court. Besides, the distance on the beach was getting wet. So there was really pressure on us to close the beach before the time was being closed. There was this pressure on the beach, and the distance was getting wet. And we only want to get to a situation where the beach will collapse. If the beach had collapsed, We'll stay with the Roads and Transport Committee, this time uh, with concerns to the University of Ghana Roads. Now, it says that it will need further directive from Speaker of Parliament, Edo Duaja, to take action over the decision uh, by University of Ghana to limit access to roads to campus. You recall that some parents with wars in schools on the University of Ghana campus Monday when he protested the decision of the authorities not to allow them enter the school to drop off their kids uh, without a car sticker. The parents out of anger also decided to block the entrance of the university and the process denying other vehicles access to the campus. 400 cities um, I, just I, to drop off their children I, I in we, the school. I, I think we need to look at the question another way. Mm. Why come this issue coming up again? Is it because the commitment government made has not been concretized? Or there's no trust between Flagstaff House and the investor. No, I think uh, excuse me. Let, 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 let me, let me okay. finish. You've made your point. Let me finish. Because I believe that is the crust of the matter. Because if the university have gone for a loan and government is not properly taking care of that loan, naturally nobody will be going to the castle to be asking them to, for repayment of the Ministry of Finance. Uh. They will be going to the university. And first and foremost, naturally the university will have to protect its assets because the more people use the road, the quicker it might destroy it. Mm. And therefore, if the university is behaving the way it's behaving currently, that if you don't have a sticker, you have not paid for social and so you don't get access, the question we should ask ourselves is, what is government's response to the matter? If government said it was going to pay the loan, has it gone to see the bankers? Have they signed the necessary agreement so that nobody is putting pressure on the university? Mm. Or there's so much uncertainty but hanging around the, around the... What does the committee know about that? We don't have any information because the last time we finished our report, after we've made our recommendation, I think that the speaker withdrew his directives and therefore we couldn't present the report. Taking a cue from the fact that the thing was in court and government that also issued directives that they were taking over the loan. As we speak now, we should ask the university people, has the government really taken over the loan or not? As for university assets, people can have access to investing. And naturally, if the university is taking strategy, I believe we need to put the question squarely at the table of the president because he said he was going to take up the loan. I agree and I feel that's I what we should do. What do you call a gated school without a wall? Well, the students of Amenfiman Senior High School in the Wasa Amenfi East, East District of the Western Region would like to know, uh, since this is their situation, people, cars and animals crisscross the school even uh, while lessons are underway. For Headmaster Joshua Eba Beidu, the situation is more than a nuisance and it has become a security threat. A report by Western Regional Correspondent William Benjamin Peters. Amenfiman Senior High School was selected by government in 2003 as one of the 38 model schools to be upgraded. Over a decade later, you would not know it. The structures look run down and wear the scars of time. But the lack of pleasant building is not of paramount concern to school authorities. The school's boundaries are non-existent, although, ironically, there is a gate. People and vehicles freely traverse the campus on the way to homes and farms. Animal graze around and casually stroll through classrooms. Classes are often disrupted by honking vehicles and loud conversations of passerby. 
However, teachers and students have a lingering fear that criminals will take advantage of the lack of security to attack the school, and the headmaster agrees. People use our compound to their adjoining houses, and the, this sort of thing is disturbing Now it is both human vehicular and the human uh, traffic, and it's not the best. And uh, we cannot even identify the people who move through. So our security is threatened. So we need a fence wall to stop those people. We've started, but it's not easy because it's something that they've been doing. They think they've been using the roof from time immemorial and they should continue. You're watching news today. I'll be right back. Thank you very much for staying on news today. Let's talk energy. In January, the VRA warned Ghana could suffer another power crisis due to the discouraging level of water in the Akosumbo Dam. The VRA noted consumers should brace up for tougher times in 2015 with regard to power supply if the rains fail to come uh, this year for the producer to generate the required amount of the power needed for distribution. The daily demand for power currently stands at 1,984 megawatts with production of just uh, 1,650 1, megawatts. Now this has led to a shortfall in supply if you do the math, about uh, 450 megawatts of power. The situation has been compounded by the shortfall in gas supply from Nigeria to Ghana. VRA Communications Director Sam Fletcher has been speaking about the power generation and load shedding. Let's take a listen. Every year you're looking at about 250 megawatts of power that you need to be able to keep up with that demand. But secondly, the, the existing capacity that we have, the machines that we have, uh, have to undergo their usual uh, mandatory uh, maintenance works. And they are. I mean, if it's mandatory, there's no way you can skip it and say, okay, let's keep running the machine for some time. You're not doing, the, you're not doing any good to your own machines. So some machines are, have to undergo mandatory uh, maintenance work. The third one is a particular project that we're running with TICO, Takradi 2 in Abuazi, where we have to expand the machine from a simple cycle, 220 megawatts, to a combined cycle, 330. Obviously, you cannot do the tie-in with a third unit if uh, you don't shut down the machines. Uh, so quite unfortunately, those machines have to be shut down as well. 220 megawatts of power that uh, we could easily have had, but we have to do that to be able to do the tie-in. Uh, I think the, the fourth, uh, but definitely not the least, factor is gas supply from Nigeria. I'm sure you're aware that uh, our only source of natural gas to power our machines comes from Nigeria. Um, contractual volumes have uh, never been received and if they have really like seldom it's rare but uh, even at levels that we were comfortable with between 60 and 90 million standard cubic feet of uh, gas uh, normally we should receive about 120 million we've been receiving anything between 60 and 90 but in the last couple of weeks uh, the volumes and the pressures fell so woefully that it got to about 30 million now that is nothing to write home about. Putting all these factors together, we currently in the system have lost about four to 500 megawatts of power that we should have. And that is what is, is uh, currently causing us uh, our challenges. Um, currently, we are shedding about anything at peak, anything around 260 megawatts. If all the power we're talking about here is restored into the system, it means that we'll be able to meet the demand and then um, have some surplus to play around with. Uh, you, you, it depends. If you have a machine that is configured to run only on gas, then you, there's nowhere to switch to. Uh, we have machines that run on both uh, gas and crude oil. Those machines are currently running on light crude oil. Um, uh, you also do have um, a situation where uh, some machines run on gas and diesel and diesel is just bloody expensive, it's not sustainable. You just can't power your electricity on diesel or power your machines 
on diesel. You can't pay for it. So we, we don't even talk about it. I mean, the, the next option is light crude oil, which is also very more than two times the cost of gas. So we, we're looking for electricity, not just electricity, but we're looking for affordable electricity. And that is why gas is, is for us the future. If we're going to generate uh, from thermal plants, which we will anyway, because we don't have any more hydro to explore or big hydro. So we will, the future is thermal, and it means that we shouldn't stop thinking about gas. Nigeria gas is currently what we have. Uh, we are feverishly waiting for Ghana gas. But even beyond that, we should be thinking gas, 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 gas. That's the only way we would have cheap electricity or relatively cheap electricity. So there's, uh, there's an option of importing some form of gas, but they call it liquefied natural gas, bringing it into the country and then uh, having a, a regasification facility to turn the, the, the liquid gas into, into gaseous gas, if you like, uh, so that we can use them to power our machines. So the future is thermal. It means that we must keep looking for gas. Even Nigeria gas, as erratic as it is, we still don't have to do away with it. Let's get some more on the Zeri Ketis Howard is joining us, this man who is there for us, has joined us over the telephone. Hello, Eric. Hello, Kemini. Uh, what more can you tell us? Yes, um, one thing I can tell you is that the, load, the end of the load shedding, there seems to be currently no end to the load shedding. Um, when we spoke to officials here, they, what they tried to hazard a guess, what they told us was that the load shedding might end somewhere during the Easter period. So which means from now to Easter, we should experience um, a low shedding, an intensive low shedding uh, region. But they couldn't really tell us as to when exactly the low shedding will end. So they said that we should expect somewhere in the Easter. That, that's the first thing they say. And the second information is that, you know, President Mahama is actually here at Akosombo. He's meeting with officials of the DRA. Right. It's a closed-door meeting. It's not really open to the media. And um, we're trying to just... And get some information from officials as to what really transpired. But you know, officials are quite, they are tight with and the meeting is still ongoing at the moment as we are speaking. So, after when we get that information, we'll let the U.S. know about it. But besides that, and as well, the, the um, officials here also had um, a sort of a social corporate responsibility with some of the traditional leaders here, where they, they, they reassure them of their support to them and um, to, to let them know that. The, the scholarship fund and the, the promises that they made to them in terms of giving them access to potable drinking water and other stuff that they promised them, they will go ahead to do it. So it's been a, it's been quite a busy day at Kosovo, and um, officials are still trying to just let people know, Ghanaians know that um, they are doing everything possible to manage the low shedding situation. Thank you very much, Eric. For that, uh, Eric Ketisawa joined us from Akusumbo, where the VRA is touring the Akusumbo Hydroelectric uh, Dam. We move on to some other stories. And the Ghana Revenue Authority has entered a bilateral agreement with the Royal Netherlands to modernize the process of revenue collection by the authority's customs division. The move, according to the GRA, will make the customs administration more transparent and efficient. The Royal Netherlands has finally consented to a tax modernization program for the GRE after four years of discussions. The two-year agreement will take customs officials to the Netherlands to be trained in customers' valuation, lab draft, examination of goods, among others, to help in revenue collection. The area of customs is one area where it has been difficult for us to obtain expertise to modernize the customs processes and procedures and the way we do things. So when the offer came from the Dutch to give us the assistance, we seized the opportunity with both hands and the cooperation has been very beneficial and fruitful and it holds even greater promise. For the Netherlands, the agreement is a major step to modernizing customs administration in Ghana. In general, when you look at, for example, uh, customs, uh, and you start to uh, modernize customs, uh, what you see is that uh, systems uh, get much more transparent. Uh, people know from both sides what to, uh, what to expect. Uh, and you see rapid increases uh, in revenue on the one hand, because people know that uh, there is no uh, benefit in evading uh, uh, customs. 
uh, and on the other hand also the, the room for, uh, for uh, deals uh, like for example smuggling becomes less. So that will be uh, largely beneficial uh, for Ghana if everybody pays his dues or her dues as, as he or she should. That would be a large uh, benefit uh, for Ghana. The program will follow a gap analysis and needs assessment of the customs division of the GRE and provide the required solutions. Food Sovereignty Ghana has called on Parliament to explain to Ghanaians the rules and ethics of lobbying currently being applied in the country. Alban Bagvin, chairperson of the Parliamentary Select Committee on Constitutional, Legal and Parliamentary Affairs, uh, the committee considering the Plant Breeders Bill stated that MPs take bribes to pass laws through Parliament as reported by the Daily Graphic on Monday, March 10, 2014. Now, what this has got to do with the Food Sovereignty Ghana, we'll find out. I have here with me, Duke Tego, he's Deputy Chair for Food Sovereignty Ghana. What has it got, got to do with you, Duke? Yes, um, first, um, we need to state that it was not by divine right or by some exceptional brilliance that uh, we have about 230 parliamentarians in the parliament of Ghana. Mm. The Ghanaian people deliberately went to the polls and voted for these people so that they will go to parliament and represent our collective interest. In so doing, we hope that they will put in place laws and measures mm. that would you know, help to us addressing the challenges that confront our country. And therefore, the news that some companies and individuals can sometimes influence parliamentarians mm. to actually, you know, uh, pass certain bills through parliament is an issue which frightens food sovereignty Ghana very much. Right. And for this reason, we believe that if there are any rules or ethics that surrounds or govern lobbying, then it must be an issue for public knowledge. So we know exactly how this lobbying is done. But if there's a situation where this is not known, and uh, some companies or individuals can write pieces you know, or, of information on papers for MPs to go on the floor of parliament and, 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 and uh, 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 read them out. Is, is that something you know? You know happens or you just assume it? You see, um, Mr. Bagwin mm. is not like one of us. He was in parliament and or he has been in parliament since the return to multi-party democracy. He has been in parliament since 1993. He was once a majority leader, you understand? And he has had touch with each and every one of the members of parliament. And therefore, he couldn't be speaking from conjecture. Moreover, this is not the very first time this has come up. It's come up many times over the years. Yeah. And there must be a reason why the laws being passed through parliament is not helping to alleviate the suffering of our people. And we are very worried because we have an issue with the Plant Breeders Bill currently before the Select Committee on Constitutional, Parliamentary and Legal Affairs. And Mr. Bagbin is the chairperson of this committee. We have raised several issues with the Pan Bidders Bill, not just Food Sovereignty Ghana. Many other organizations have done so. The Catholic Bishops Conference mm. and even individuals like Professor S.K.B. Asante but the have written about the intellectual property aspect of the Pan Bidders Bill. Right. And we are expecting that as by now, they would have called all of these interests together. Mm. as the Speaker of Parliament directed, mm. so that we can all discuss the Plan Breeders Bill, if indeed it but was th meant to serve the interests of Ghanaians. That Ghanians. discussion did happen, didn't it? That discussion happened when we, you know, uh, 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 gave a petition to Parliament. And we were called to come and sit down with them and explain exactly what challenges we had. Mm. We were then told that they were going to look at our petition and get back to us letting us know which portions of the petition have been amended. And it's important that they do this exercise, then we have some clarity about whether the clauses we are raising, about like clause 23, mm. and all of the other clauses that seek to put the sovereignty of Ghana below plant breeders has been considered. This has not been done. What? And we think they are going against the order of the Speaker of Parliament. And, and what were the timelines for those uh, re reports to get back to you after the discussions? It has been three months since we met Parliament. Mm. And we were made to understand that they were going to consider our views and get back to us in the shortest possible time. We haven't had any calls from them. Mm -hmm. We have tried very hard to find out exactly what is the state of the Plant Breeders Bill before the Parliament of Ghana and the Select Committee. Unfortunately, 
Information is not forthcoming. And this gives us reason to worry. I see. Uh, when you raise your concerns with Parliament, let's, let's go through the concerns again. Yes. There are various aspects of the Plant Breeders Bill which um, borders on intellectual property rights that will be granted to the plant breeder because uh, it is believed that um, these breeders are producing variety of crops um, which uh, they have brought onto the market and serving Ghanaian farmers mm. and yes, so they are getting nothing out of it. And our argument is that as of now, there are no private plant breeding institutions in Ghana. All the plant breeding institutions are public funded. It is our taxes that are used in paying the plant breeders. We buy them the gadgets. We fund the institution. And therefore, the researches they do belongs to the government and people of Ghana. The, the attempt by any individual to appropriate these varieties as their personal property is completely unfair and we consider it to be absolute criminality. This should not be allowed to happen. It isn't. There is another clause of clause mm. 23, mm. which says that the plant breeder's right is independent mm. of any measure taken by the Republic to regulate commerce or any aspect of plant breeding in Ghana. Very well. Isn't this we disagree with. How, how different is this from farmers who are already buying the Obatampa maize seeds? How different is that? Because the knowledge I have is that after you've used the Obatampa seed and, and you, you replant that seed you have, it will grow all right. But as time goes on, uh, the yield that you had with the first seed may not be the same. How different is that practice from what the, the, the parliament is seeking to pass already? Assistance now. Mm. All of those varieties are not belonging to any individual. It belongs to the CSIR for those varieties that have been produced. Mm. But those varieties are for the government. At any time, we could choose that we give these varieties free to farmers for one reason or the other. What is happening now is that the individual breeders who have been paid to produce those varieties are seeking to claim private rights over these varieties. And this is where we have a problem. You understand? So of course, the Batampa, the Mamaba, and all of the wonderful research done by the CSIR and other public plant breeding institutions are helping our farmers. And information we have now is that it has brought returns in the billions of Ghana City to the CSIR. So they haven't made losses out of these varieties that have been produced. But as of now, the situation is that they are saying that whatever went into the production of those varieties are the intellectual property of the scientists. And we are saying that it is true, but you have been paid for it by our taxes. So how then, then do you claim that we should give you the uh, plant breeders' rights so that you can own these varieties? It is completely unfair. And moreover, talking about the plant breeders' bill, what it is stating is that any international organization to which Ghana is a treaty, mm. All the, all the other members of that organization have the right to register for patent rights in Ghana. When this happens, then it means that we are opening the floodgates for foreign multinational institutions mm. like Monsanto, which has been in the business of plant breeding, mm. to completely crowd out other, you know, uh, 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 breeders but, in this, in this but, institution. But it also says that it, it would deal on a first come first serve basis. And so if if our scientists have it and they register it first, or they send their application first, they should have be the first to have it. Uh, if you have read the Plan Breeders Bill very closely, mm. it states that these foreign companies are allowed to establish agents or have agents here in Ghana so that they will be the intermediaries or that they can register their seats on their behalf. Mm. And from what has happened from practice in Ghana with other aspects of our country, we are very sure that this bill is tilted towards allowing foreign multinational corporations mm. to take over the business of plant breeding. And this must not be allowed. If it is allowed, then it means that we are handing over the right of our country over plant breeding to other foreigners. And that is right. just what the Plant Breeders Bill seeks to do. Right. This must not be accepted. Thank you very much, Jude, for joining us on News. Uh,
news today. Duke Tego is a member, is deputy chair for Food Sovereignty Ghana. Move on to some other business stories. And the Ghana Mine Workers Union has said between January 2013 and March 2014, it lost 3,080 members or about 16.1% 16 of its membership through retrenchment. Uh, blamed on the slump in the price of gold. The Ghana Mine Workers Union said it is worried that redundancy is always considered the major option to manage financial and operational crisis within the industry. The Ghana Mine Workers Union has challenged the moral and ethical business conscience of mining companies using the falling of gold price to create a major source of job insecurity. As the industry considers small job costs to streamline costs, the union fears its membership will further shrink. Newmont Ghana has said it will terminate uh, the employment of an additional 500 to 600 miners at a lane of 300 last year. Anglo Gold Ashanti, Obwase Mine, on the other hand, uh, returned 430 workers last year and is expected to send home an extra 400 this year. The local government ministry has started a round of zonal uh, conferences to develop strategic guidelines for metropolitan, municipal and district assemblies to optimize their internally, internally generated funds. This comes on the back of challenges identified with the management of these funds. The first of the zonal fora for the northern region, uh, the northern zone rather, is being held in the Ashanti regional capital, Kumasi. Mahmoud Mohammed Nuridin reports. The framework would focus on thematic areas such as sources of local revenue mobilization and collection, utilization and service delivery, and the rights and responsibilities of taxpayers. The zonal conference is also intended to provide a better understanding of the context of local governance reforms and their implications for revenue generation, as well as encourage participants to reflect on the key policy, legal, institutional, administrative and capacity issues among others. The two-day conference is being attended by participants drawn from MMDAs and other public sector institutions including the Ghana Revenue Authority, development partners, local government practitioners, NGOs as well as other civil society actors. Deputy Local Government Minister Emmanuel Kojo Ajekum bemoaned the low percentage of total internally generated funds raised by MMDAs. Ghana has chalked tremendous success in the decentralization process, such as the implementation of composite budgeting, the transfer of district assemblies common fund, the introduction of district development facility, and the urban development grant. Despite the fact that the IGF forms an integral part of the local government finances, it is sad to know that IGF as a percentage of total revenue of most MNDAs is nothing to be proud of. He says one of the key challenges bedeviling MMDAs is weak leadership and the lack of capacity by most MMDAs to effectively and efficiently improve internally generated funds. In most instances, MMDAs initiate arrangements for improvement of IGF without properly taking co cognizance of the risk involved in such arrangements or agreements. You recall that in recent times, some trainers of beneficiaries of the Azon Taba Cottage Industries and Exchange Programs dressmaking module in the Upper East Region are calling on the company to pay monies owed to them for three months of work done. Albert Sori has this report from Bogotanga. According to the trainers, after a joint agreement between them and Asantaba Cottage Industries and Exchange Program was reached in June 2012, the company agreed to pay a monthly fee of 45 Ghana cities for the training of each beneficiary. However, the company has paid us for only three months. And this was even in 2013. This revealed that the company owned each member of this group numbering over 700 three months we have made frantic effort to get our balance paid to us but no avail we therefore decided 
to you, the media, the watchdog of this, our democracy, to make our concern known to whom it may concern, so that we can have our money paid to us, so that we can pay back the loans some of our members have to take to buy machines and other materials or equipment to meet the terms of the contract. However, the Asun Taba Cottage Industries and Exchange Program only paid for three out of the six months of work done. At a press conference in Bogatanga, the trainers under the dressmaking model of Asun Taba threatened to take legal action against the company within two weeks after the press conference if monies due them were not paid. He said all the attempts to get Asun Taba to pay the monies proved futile. Also aware that the government has released the monies needed for this company to make payment to their partners like us. But we do not know why we are not yet paid. We do not want to believe that this is a ploy to subtitle the effort of the government to provide jobs and incomes for the people of Ghana. We also wish to appeal to the government upon notice of this press conference to impress upon Asuntaba Cottage Industry to honor the outside of the budget. We at this point... Yeah. Now, local leaders in the Niger Delta want to unite competing communities to pressure Shell Petroleum to pay billions of dollars in preparations and clean up of fishing areas they say were wasted in a 2011 oil spill. Shell disputes the claim, maintaining the spill never hit Nigerian shores or damaged the fishing industry. About two million lives were devastated by the Bonga oil spill. Early this year, the Nigerian government said it was fining Shell $11.5 billion for the Bonga spill. In the past, Delta residents have rebelled against oil companies and the government. Traditional leaders say the fear more unrest in the Niger Delta if the people's concerns are not addressed. Baba Tando brings us sports after this. Good afternoon. I am Baba Tando with the latest in the world of sports brought to you by the current courtesy of Carbell. Now, looks like football fans seem not to have taken a cue from the physical assault which led to the death of referee Che Ando last week as another bizarre episode befell, uh, befell Class 1 referee Ali Al Hassan in a Division 1 match between Unity FC and Techiman City FC over the weekend. Class 1 referee Ali Al Hassan from Tamale was kicked, slapped, and chased across the field by IRA players, fans, and team officials after issuing a yellow card during a Division 1 league match played between Unity FC and Tachiman FC over the weekend. The incident took place a week after another referee, Che Ando, lost his life in a second division game in the Western region. The trouble began when a Unity FC player was penalized for fisting the ball into the net of Tachiman City in the 25th minute of the game. The home fans who thought the referee should have awarded a goal pounced on him, seized his card, and tore his shirt. Despite the presence of five police officers on duty, fans of Unity FC managed to scale the inner perimeter and attack the referee in full glare of the Ghana Football Association Ethics Committee Chairman Nana E.J. Ampofo. The game was held temporarily for 35 minutes when the referee was given some medication and was forced by the home fans to continue with the match. Both the Ghana Football Association and the Referees Association are yet to make a comment about the incident. Francesco Totti scored on his return as Roma beat Udinese to maintain their grip on second place in the Italian Serie A. Totti, who had been out for a month with a buttock injury, opened the scoring from a rebound and Mattia Destro doubled the lead. Giampiero Pinzi halved the deficit, but Vasily Sorosidis restored the two-goal march in before Dusan Basta ensured a nervous final 10 minutes for Roma. Chelsea manager Jose Mourinho believes the Blues legend Didier Drogba is still one of the best strikers in the world. The Galatasaray forward who left Stamford Bridge in June 2010 returns to London 
for Tuesday's second leg of their Champions League round of 16 tie. And Mourinho is quoted as saying, Drogba, the same player at 36 years old as he was at 26, nobody is, but he is certainly still one of the best strikers in the world. Drogba said he may not celebrate if he scores against his former teammates. The Ivory Coast striker netted 157 goals in 342 appearances during an eight-year spell at Chelsea. According to former England international Danny Mills, Manchester United might not win the Premier League title for another decade. The current champions uh, suffered a 3-0 def defeat by Liverpool on Sunday and are seventh in on the table. A so the Champions League tonight is Chelsea versus Galatasaray in the Stamford, at the Stamford Bridge. And then we also have Real Madrid up against Schalke New Fear at the Santiago Bernabeu in Spain. And then Costa Rica in the city of Liberia. Ghana takes on Germany in the second Group B game of the ongoing FIFA Under-17 Women's World Cup. Ghana up against Germany. The match will be played at 11 p.m. or 22 hours, 23 hours GMT. And then in the other Group B game is Canada up against People's Republic of Korea. That will be a wrap for sports brought to you by the kind courtesy of Cowbell. My name is Barbara Tando. Good afternoon. Let's get into some arts and entertainment. German-based Ghanaian fashion designer Teresa Onan speculated to have come between former Ghanaian big brother housemate Ali Kam and his lover Pokelo has dismissed the report saying she's not interested in dating young guys like Ali Kam. As soon as he pays my bride price. Tell it's no small money, but I'm raising it. This has been considered one of the most successful big brother Africa love affairs thus far. At least, that was until news broke on Monday, March 17, that Polly Kim, as Ellie Kim and his BBA housemate Lava, Pokelo are commonly referred to have split. Ellie Kim was rumored to be dating Teresa Onen, a Ghanaian fashion designer and a real estate manager based in Germany. But the designer has dismissed the report in media interviews, saying she is not into small boys. She said the relationship she has developed so far with Elikem since coming down to Ghana about a month ago is strictly business. According to her, Elikem and Pokelo both modeled for her when she launched her clothes line in Ghana. Elikem, on the other hand, has equally dismissed the report saying Pokelo is still the love of his life. He, however, admitted the report nearly marred his relationship with Pokelo. Although Ali Kim said he thought Teresa was responsible for the spread of the rumor, she has denied putting the information out. It is still unclear who started the rumors and for what purpose. Right, so Rafa Kenya West has pleaded no contest and has been sentenced to two years probation for assaulting a photographer at Los Angeles International Airport. Kanye West must also attend 24 anger management sessions and complete 250 hours of community service for the misdemeanor battery last July. Paparazzo Daniel Ramos accused Kanye of punching him and grabbing his camera in an unprovoked attack. Kanye 36 maintains uh, his innocence. The plea cannot be used against him in a civil lawsuit brought against him by Ramos. That's it for the uh, recap of our headlines. Parliamentary Select Committee on Roads and Transport faults Ghana Highway Authority for charging unapproved fares for the use of ferries on the Volta, Lake, Volta River. Ghana Mine Workers Union has said between January 2013 and March 2014, it lost 3,080 members, about 16.1% of its membership. Thank you very much for staying to find more news on myjaronline.com. My name is Kimini Nyamani. Amana. Goodbye.